praise the Lord. So heavens, three levels, the earth and both are called created realities. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning. So I said God does not have a beginning or end. So what is the Bible really talking about beginning, in the beginning? Beginning of what? Beginning of what? Beginning of time. God creates time. Okay? Because time is a created reality. Okay? So if God created the beginning, He started the stop clock or the stop, st stopwatch. Now is the beginning of time. In the beginning, God creates the heavens and earth. So before He created the heavens and earth, where was God? In the spiritual where is the spiritual realm where is the spiritual realm what is God God is omni omni present he's everywhere right so God is everywhere he's omni present the spiritual realm is a greater realm than the created reality. So the spiritual realm is the uncreated reality. It is the uncreated reality in which God existed and from the spiritual realm God presses the button start beginning time and he creates first the unseen created reality which is heavens and the seen created reality which is earth so the spiritual realm we can say then is greater than these two realms of created realities hmm? so what we call heaven is not somewhere up in the sky you know you have to go in the SpaceX uh, rocket and then you have to go past the galaxies and that's where heaven is you know it is parallel to the physical seen realities so you can be in this room and experience heaven just by sitting on that couch and closing your eyes you can be in worship and experience a part of heaven amen you can be in your bedroom on your bed and you can be praying and you can close your eyes and say Jesus I thank you and I worship you and you begin to call upon his name and you can experience the unseen creator realm which is heaven just by being in a place and connecting with God through prayer through worship through praying in tongues through corporate worship we can experience a part of heaven because these two realms are parallel to each other are you with you can experience and that is why God has created us to be conduits of heaven people who carry heaven and people who release heavenly atmosphere upon this earth that's why Jesus says pray what how should you pray thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven so God who was in the spiritual realm creates two realms which is uh, heaven and earth and he is in heavens heaven in the third heaven and then he places us on what the earth the physical created seen reality and he tells us whatever I have in the heavenly realms you recreate on earth as it is in on, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven in heaven I have peace so you bring peace on earth and you are responsible for it in heaven I have joy you are now responsible to create an atmosphere of joy on earth 
In heaven there is no sickness, no pain. In heaven there is joy. In heaven there is fullness of the glory and the presence of God. I want you to be the carriers of God. I want you to be the carriers of me. And by carrying me, I want you to bring that joy. I want you to bring that peace. I want you to bring heaven on earth. Say this with me. I have to bring bring heaven heaven on on earth. A lot of people are trying to escape and go to heaven. And that creates a lot of irresponsible Christians. I say irresponsible Christians because they don't understand the purpose that God has given them on earth. All they ever do is complain about how bad it is on earth. If it is bad on earth, it is your responsibility to fix things. Amen. Say this with me. It is my responsibility. responsibility. If things are messed up in your life, it is your responsibility to fix it. If things are not going right in your life, it is your responsibility to to fix it. On earth as it is in Heaven. heaven. Amen. We were not created to go to heaven. We were created to live on earth and to be productive, to work, to to, to do things for him, to be efficient, to be effective. God is always working. He wants us to work as well. Amen. He's not a lazy God. He's not a God without a vision. He's not a God without a purpose. God has a vision. God has a purpose. He has a plan and an agenda and he's always working. And he's looking for human beings who would co-labor with him to bring his will from his created unseen reality, which is heaven, to earth. And he needs human beings who will be co-laborers with him to do it. Let me tell you, without humans, it is impossible for God to do anything on earth. If God wants to do something on earth, he needs a legal ground by which he can work. Amen. And that is why tonight I'm going to talk to you about how to understand these two realms, to understand the heart of God, to make sure that you are an effective believer on earth. Amen. Don't be the kind of lazy believer who's waiting to go to heaven because you want to you want to you want to get rid of all your earthly responsibilities. When you go to heaven, God will ask you, "What did you do with what I gave you?" God, I just hid it away so I can just die and come and see you. God will just say, "You fool. That life I gave you was not for you to die and come to earth, to heaven." The life I gave you was for you to be productive on earth. But you were supposed to know my heart and my will, which is in heaven, and bring it to earth. Amen. If in heaven I am productive, on earth I want you to be productive. If in heaven I am full of joy, on earth I want you to be full of joy. Amen. So we need to understand the created realities these two created realities and of course the uncreated reality the spiritual realm in how we can connect with God know his heart and be the kind of people who bring heaven on earth so the primary function of the church is to is in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 and 12 Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 and 12 this is the primary function of the church. Can you read Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 and 12? Why God gave the church? It is not a religious institution. It is not a community. Yes, of course we are a community. We can be an organization, all of that. But the primary function of the church is not to be an institution, is not to be a religious group that just gathers and feels good about itself. It's about purpose. Everybody say purpose. So there is a purpose, there is a primary purpose that God has for the church. So read Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 onwards. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of saints. For the what? Equipping of? Saints. Equipping of saints. 
So some people got handpicked to be apostles, prophets, pastors, and all these guys. And he put them in the church. Not just to be leaders. Not just to lord over people. Not just to control people. Not just to sit there and say, I have a title. The primary function of this fivefold is to equip the equip the saints. Equip the saints. But the problem with many pastors these days, they don't even pray and connect with heaven to know the heart of God and to teach the people what they will have to learn. They don't pray. They go to Bible school, theology school, everything. They go, read, 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 and then they'll come Google uh, Saturday nights. What can I preach tomorrow? They are not communicating heaven on earth. What they are communicating is Google information. So therefore, the believers are not equipped. They are not what? They are not equipped. If God gives a group of people to me, I am responsible for your spiritual growth. Which means when I stand before God, God will ask me, what did you do with the ship I gave you? I am accountable. Are you with me? So if I lead you astray, is my fault, not yours. Amen. So the problem is, many people, many leaders, these apostles, prophets, what they do, they don't sit and get things from the heavenly realms, what needs to be relayed in the earthly realm. Because God said, my will, thy will be done, what? On earth as it is in. So it is my responsibility to primarily go to God and say, God, what is your will in heaven for your people? What is the word I need to preach today? What is the word I need to preach this season? What is the word for this year? Is that a word for Simeon today? Is that a word for Sonia today? Is that a word for Brendan today? Is that a word for Isaac today? Talk to me, Lord. And anytime God says something, I say it to you personally, or I will, if doesn't say, then I will just hear what he has me to preach that week or that Bible study, and I just share. And when I share, I am not just giving you information. What I'm giving you is I'm communicating life. Everybody say communicate life. Yeah. Why? Because the Bible says for the equipping of the saints. Then continue that verse. For the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. For the edifying of the body of Christ. What does edification mean? You have a certain way of thinking about the world. You have a certain way of thinking that, must, that might be destructive for you. But God is saying, by the teaching and the communication of life, edify their mind. Help them to think heaven bound. Help them to think in a different way. Help them to think with a renewed mind. Help them to think based on the word of God. Help them to focus on me and not on life and not on death. Edification. Edification means something that's corrupt and you take it and when gold is dirty, you put it through fire. You edify the gold. When you purify something, it is being edified. Continue. Till we all come to the unity. So, uh, till when is God asking us to do that? Till we all come to the unity of the faith. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. Unity of the I don't think all churches in the world have come to the unity of the faith because we are so interested in focusing on our differences than embracing our unity and what we believe in. Amen. Theologically, we may be different. You know, different churches may be believe in different things, but we need to come to the unity of the faith. Continue. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man, to and to the knowledge of the Son of how many of you can say I have perfect knowledge of Jesus? Not yet, right? We are all growing. We are all being changed. We are all being edified. We are all being transformed into the image of Christ. So when we come to church, when I say come to church, ecclesia is the gathering. We've been called out of the world into the body of Christ. The reason why we are here. <laughs> the reason why we are here. 
is not just for the fellowship of course it is important we are family we love each other everything but we must not forsake the gathering of believers to grow in the knowledge of Jesus the knowledge of the son until we all come to a to a perfect man so God is waiting for the beautification of the bride of Christ for a perfect man what should our aim be huh what should our primary aim be as Christians What should our primary aim be as Christians? To, to grow in the knowledge of, son of, of the Son of Man till you all come to a perfect, perfect man. man. Everybody say, knowledge of the Son of Man, knowledge of the son of man. Till, I till I become perfect. perfect. So what should your goal be? What should your goal be? To grow in the knowledge of the Son of Man and to become perfect. Now, hi, welcome. Okay, once again, read that verse. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. Till we all, okay, so number one, few things that Paul lists there in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, is it? 13. 13. Ephesians 4 13 unity of faith next and of the knowledge of the Son of God knowledge of Son of God, God to a perfect man to a perfect man what else to the measure of the teacher of the fullness of Christ fullness of Christ what is the measure he's asking you to use the stature of the okay three important things that Paul notes here okay you know a lot of Christians say you know what I just want to get by in life you know I'm okay I just want to you know slip and fall and trip and fall and somehow make it make it you know I'm okay if I just you know, just make it in life. How many of you want to just make it? And how many of you want to finish a great victory? Amen. You want to just get by in life or you want to do great in life? Great. Yeah. How many of you... See, it doesn't matter what circumstances you're going through. It doesn't matter what limitations are stopping you right now. Don't, I, I'm not asking you to look at your limitations. I'm not asking you to look at all the difficult things that you're going through right now. Because my responsibility is to present to you the truth of who you are, what your identity is, and what your potential is, and what you can do in this life. Because many times Christians have this mindset. The picture that they have is, Jesus has finished the work for me. Thank you. You saved me. I'm just going to get by in life. I'm just going to fight my way through life. But it doesn't have to be that way all your life. Are you with me? You can, you can have a season of the wilderness in your life. But forever, God's will for you is to dwell in the promised land. But many of us stay in the wilderness because we think the wilderness is the promised land. Because sometimes it is possible for you to confuse the wilderness with the promised land and you think it's so amazing because even in the wilderness there was manna. There was provision. And you can mistake your wilderness to be your promised land if you don't know what real fullness is. Amen? Amen. There was manna in, from heaven. There was meat from heaven. God told her, I'm going to take you to a land flowing with milk and honey. 
and the and, and the mama came every morning you know and the mama tasted like honey and it would cover the whole horizon with, with, with this white flake and it looked like milk so it gave them the illusion of milk and honey and they thought wow this is my dream job this is my promised land but maybe God is just using that job that you have right now to train you to be the CEO in a few years and maybe God is using that difficult situation that you're going through right now to train you and prepare you for the promised land amen, amen. but if you think that is what God has for me and you settle and you believe it you will settle you will just be there you will just go around in circles for 40 years and before you realize this that is what God had for me I missed it for what because you failed to see amen, amen. So what is God saying there in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13? Till you all come to the unity of faith in the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. Which means it is possible for every believer to become a perfect, perfect man. To, to not struggle with sin. To not struggle with temptation. Do not struggle with laziness. Do not struggle with difficult things that you're going through. It is possible for you to kick that bad habit. The devil just lied to you and he told you that it's not going to happen and you believed it. You believed it. Are you with me? You believed it. You, you just believed that you are supposed to be middle class. Because why? Because your parents told you, you see us, we're middle class. You see those guys, they're the rich, so you believed it. So all your life you believe, I, 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 I ain't going to be rich. I'm not going to make it alive because that's who I am, I'm middle class. One day, maybe somebody in your family told you, you know, we, 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 we just the poor. You see those guys, though, though, they're the rich ones. So you segregated. There was a, there was a mental block in your head that just told you that you are not rich that you're not good enough and you just stayed on this side of the fence and he said you know i'll just be where i'm comfortable with but last week i said the finished work of jesus means he not just forgave your sins he not just healed you of your sickness he also gave you prosperity he gave you a sound mind He's able to fix every issue in your family, in your life. He's able to give abundantly more than you can ever imagine. He's able to do more than you can ever imagine in your life. The only question that I can ask you today is, are you willing to believe the finished work of Jesus? Or are you going to stay on this side of the fence and say, hey, you know, I'm, uh, this is my fate. This is my fate. There is no such thing as fate. Your fate, your future, your destiny is what you write about yourself. Amen? Is what you create. Not even God. A lot of people say God is writing my story. No. You have to write your story. You know why? In God's heart and his mind, you are already a success. Amen? He has put you on the top of the top of the top of everything is now up to you how much you are going to see how much you are going to believe and you keep going until everything that God has spoken about you comes to pass Amen, Amen. Some people say I'm just waiting God is writing my love story No, sometimes you have to be watchful and pray watch and pray watch and pray when you're praying you watch <laughs> Amen. I told one there was one brother, he said, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. I said, Has God showed yes, he's, he's God showed me. I said, How long how many years you're praying? You'll be watching and praying for many years. It's time for action. Go, step out by faith. Ask her out. Amen. So sometimes you have to write your own story. You know, Brennan was telling me, I 
I'm so glad that I went over and talked to Rachel that day. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Yeah, he's, he's, he's so glad. He's so glad he was in that, in that place at that time where Rich was. You know, it's amazing. Um, the first, I'm not the first, maybe, I think it was the first home Bible study that I ever had in the Philippines when I was a missionary in the Philippines was in was the Rachel's house. One day, my, one of my bishops called me and he said, I want you to go and have a Bible study in, uh, in this person's house. I'm like, yeah, sure. I end up and they used to make some nice fried chicken for me every Thursday. <laughs> so every Thursday I would be like, yeah, you fried chicken. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, word of God. <laughs> so I used to go there and I used to teach their family. Their friends and family used to come to gather together. I used to teach them the word of God every Thursday. And I'm glad I did. I'm glad I went. I obeyed God and I went there. Because that is... And then we found out that Brendan's from... Australia, and you know the rest is history, and now she lives in Bayswater, I live in Bayswater. <laughs> Come on, you know? And Brendan was the one who picked me up from the airport, and I stayed in his house for three months. He helped us grow our roots here. Imagine. Are you with me? Though, if, if I just said, oh, I'm so tired, I already have so many Bible studies, back-to-back -back Bible studies, I'm not going to go there. I probably wouldn't be friends with him today. Amen? So every little decision, you know, when you are in your wilderness spirit, when you are in that, in that small stages of life, don't give up. Keep believing. Keep believing in the call that God has given you. Keep, keep, keep hustling. Keep believing because God has great and marvelous plans for you. Amen? Amen. Don't give up. It might be tougher than in the beginning. It might seem like you're repeating things over and over again every day. Oh God, I believed you. I trusted you. Why is things not happening? Oh, it's the same old, same old grind every day. Be on it. Do it. Believe in the vision that God has given you. If God has given you a word, He's taking you somewhere. Amen? Don't stop believing. So, the fullness of the... What is that? I, I even I can't read my own. What did I write? Fullness of Christ. Like, what is that? Unit? Yeah, unit. Yeah, it's Christ. Yeah, sorry, even I couldn't read. So, fullness of Christ. Uh, that's the measure. What is the measure that God gives us? What is it? The, the, the fullness of the stature. So he, he, the Bible says that it's possible for you to come to the fullness of the measure of Christ. Yeah. It is possible. Even God wouldn't mention it in the Bible. So we think that all our life, I'm supposed to struggle with this bad habit. All my life, I'm supposed to struggle with this thing in my life. And I'm never going to be perfect. So let me just get by. I'm not going to make it financially, so I'm always going to be in debt. But it's up to you to believe. No, I will not be in debt for the rest of my life. Amen? It's what you believe, what you make out of your life. Amen? See, God has already finished His part. Everybody say, God finished His part. God finished His part. Now He's waiting for you to take he's waiting for you to take what he has already accomplished on earth as it is in so according to heaven you are already rich in your reality you're poor or mediocre or whatever but in god's reality there is no poor christian so if god was to appear in front of you right now and you tell him god i'm poor please i need money god will tell you no you're not poor. I've already made you rich. It's now up to you to see the reality of the truth that I have already provided for you through my son and work towards and believe towards and speak towards achieving everything I have already achieved for you. Are you with me? You can apply in every area of your life. You can apply it in your salvation. Which means when you become a Christian, you are no longer a sinner. Right? You are no longer a sinner. So if you are a Christian, you cannot call yourself a Even when you sin, you are not a You are not even a sinner saved by Why? Because that sinner who was saved by grace died. You are a born again. You are a new creation. 
Last week I said, what are the three things that God gave and provided for you? A new life. You became a new creation. He brought you into a new kingdom. And he has a new measure for you. The stature of the fullness of the measure of Christ. That is the, that, that's what God has for you. But the problem is, we don't believe what God has for us. We believe in our own opinions and in what religion teaches us. Religion teaches us to be afraid of God. Religion teaches us to, yeah, 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 you're saved, but you see, but you still have to do certain things for you to be perfect. Turn to your neighbor and say, there is nothing I can do to make God love me more. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing. There's nothing. There's absolutely nothing. The only thing that you can do now is believe. And you better believe. Amen. So the first thing that he wants you to believe that you are the righteousness of God. That's the word of righteousness. That's the word of righteousness. What is the word of righteousness? The word of righteousness is to believe that God has already finished the work for me. There's nothing that I have to do in order to achieve those things. I'm already the righteousness of God. Amen. That is grace. I didn't do anything to deserve it. It was given to me as a free gift. Amen. You know, growing up, I used to feel guilty if I don't read the Bible. I used to feel guilty if I don't pray. That was the worst ever. I'm not saying that you shouldn't pray and read the Bible. You know? But what I'm saying is, reading the Bible and praying doesn't make you more righteous than you already are. Reading the Bible and praying and going to church doesn't make you more holy. None of those things make you holy. What makes you holy is the righteousness of God, of Christ Jesus, that has become your gift. You're already holy. The word holy means set apart. The word righteous means you are standing right before the king. And who made it possible for you? Christ Jesus. So there's nothing else that you can do or not do to make yourself more perfect. You're already that. Okay? But... But we live in a fallen world. We live in a world which has not yet come to the fullness of the knowledge of the measure of Christ. The church is still growing in these understandings. So therefore, God expects us to gather together and grow in the knowledge of Him. See, if I don't, like for example, right? Let's say you have a million dollars in your bank account. And you don't know about that bank account. You don't know that bank account exists. Can you access it? You won't access it. Why? Why? You don't even know. Even if you see it, you'll be like, hey, come on, you're joking. <laughs> nah, 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 I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. You did that. that, 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 that. Out of my bank, always this minus 20. <laughs> How can it be? Like, no, 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 no. Something wrong. Bank. I think it's a scam. There's a million dollars in my account. Oh, that's just, you see. So now we have different groups of people believing different things. God just wants you to accept and believe that He has already paid the price. He has already given you all. So some people they don't even know that Christ has finished it all. They don't even know that they can come to the fullness of the measure of Christ and they are perfect. They are not sinners anymore. Many Christians live all their lives with fear, thinking that they are sinners. Every five minutes, God forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. God forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Every day, waking up, God, I'm a sinner. There are some even in some parts of the world who lash themselves up and put them themselves up on crosses and, and you know, uh, and, and if I don't go to Israel and you know, ask for forgiveness, I will not be forgiven. Living with guilt and fear. Why? Because of lack of knowledge of what has already been provided for you. Amen? So you cannot access, number one, something 
that you don't even know that belongs to you. If you don't know divine health is yours, you will accept being sick. Amen? If you don't know that you are the righteousness of God, you will believe, you will live life believing that you are a sinner. That's why I don't, I don't like to sing Amazing Grace, you know. I mean, it's a beautiful song, but I don't sing it. Amazing Grace, how sweet that, huh? That saved her. Rich. Rich like me. I hate that part. Personally, okay, I, I'm not saying that you guys shouldn't sing it. You can sing it, but I don't like that part. But it says, a wretch like me. I'm not a wretch. Yeah. No, no, no. I am the glory of God. I am the righteousness of God. The beauty of God and of Christ that is... Uh, Oh wow, that's my life. That's how I look at myself. I look at myself as royalty. I look at myself as rich. I look at myself as successful. I look at myself as 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 as, as God looks at me. People must say, you, I don't care what you think about me. I think about what God says about me. Because what God says about me is true. I'm gonna keep looking at that. I'm gonna fix my eyes upon Jesus until I get to the place where I come to the fullness of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The stature, the fullness, amen? I wanna keep going on. I wanna keep going to the full measure. I don't want half baked, I want full baked. I want everything to be nice about my life. I want everything to be beautiful about my life. I may not be perfect right now, but I'm going towards it, amen? Change the way you look up, look at yourself. Change the way you you, you perceive about the, the things that you perceive about yourself. So I don't I like to sing the song because it says rich, and I immediately be, imagine myself as rich. No, I'm not the rich. I'm not a sinner. How many of you heard this? I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I don't say that anymore. It just clicked in my mind. I said, I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I am the righteousness of God. That sinner died. 15 years ago when I gave my life to Jesus. I was a sinner. That guy died. And I'm being made a new creation through Christ Jesus. I am the glory of God. I am the righteousness of God. Everything about my life is new. I'm going towards this perfect man. Amen. I will say I'm moving towards perfection. Because you, you need to have a goal. So the problem with Christians, right? They don't have a goal. That's why a lot of Christians are confused. Think, how many of you know that in business you need to have a goal to be successful? Right, Brennan, you need to have a goal. You set goals, right, every year. Like you, you are the most successful businessman in this place. So you have a goal. Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot, but <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you have a goal. Like you don't just turn up one day and say, hey, I'm just going to do something and I'm just going to expect some results. Or do you expect a goal? You expect a goal. Right? You, you want a goal. Like, this is what I'm going to achieve. This is, what, this is my yearly plan. This is what I'm going to do. Similarly, Christians must have a goal. Till they come to a... But you know what the goal of many Christians are? You know what is the goal of many Christians? Something. Just whatever, whatever. Whatever comes my way. I'll, whatever God gives me, I'll just accept it. Oh God, if you throw me in the fire, I'll accept it. If I go through the valley of shadow of death, I'll accept it. If I go through pain and suffering, or oh, if the sickness comes and makes me suffer, I'll accept it. Sounds good. Sounds very pious and sounds very... And, and a lot of times people, Christians are well-meaning. There's nothing wrong. But there's a problem. The problem is, you're setting a goal for yourself that God didn't set for you. And that comes from a place of not knowing what God has already done for you. Are you with me? You've got to set your eyes on what God has already accomplished for you. See, faith is not believing that things are going to be okay tomorrow. Faith is knowing what God has already finished for you and holding on to it until it becomes yours. Amen? Many people's versions of faith is their opinions on God and what they think God would do for them if they are nice. You with me? 
it. It doesn't matter whether you're nice or not. If you have accepted Jesus, if you are a believer, you are a new creation, the bar has been set very, very high. You are destined for success, whether you like it or not. You are destined to be embarrassed by blessings, whether you like it or not. Will there, will there be challenges along the way? Of course there will be. But that's where you equip yourself, fight the good fight of faith. Everybody say the good fight of faith. But here's what, here, here is the good thing about the good fight of faith. My dear wife always says this. She says the match is fixed. The match is? Who fixed the match? God fixed it. Who is the winner? You. Amen. In the fight of faith, there's only one loser, the enemy. Amen? There are no losers. The match has been fixed. You just got to show up and win the fights. He already won the fight and the victory for you. In fact, the truth is you're playing in the, not the live version. You're playing in the replay. How many of you watched a replay of a match or a boxing match or a football or basketball? You got the news yesterday that the match was already won, yes? Yeah? So you're watching the replay of the match. And towards the end, your team is losing, okay, in the replay. But you know the news came that your team. Will you be upset? The team is losing. <laughs> oh, what am I going to do? Come on, Jesus, please. No! You already know that your team has, has won. So this life that you live is like the replay. God has finished the live version of it and he has won the victory. Amen. He has given you the victory. The cup, it, they already put your name on the, on the championship. Amen. They've already put the name on the championship. They've already they crowned you victor. But many times Christians don't know what God has already finished for them, so they don't show up for the fight. And God is like, hey, you didn't show up. I was waiting for you with the championship. You've already given up. Look, we need to understand grace. Grace is not something that you deserve. It's not something that you got it because you know you're good at something. It's something that God decided to give to you because he just simply loves you. Amen? I decided to give all of mine to this little boy. Why? Because he's my son. Why? What Did he do anything for me? Not yet. By simply being born, I just love him. By simply being born and simply because you exist, God loves you. Wow. That's it. That's the biggest reason. Say this to me. God loves me. No. Simply because I exist. Because Let I exist. that sink into your head. Say this one more time. God loves me. God God loves loves me. me. Simply because I exist. Simply Simply because because I exist. exist. That's the truth. You don't have to do something to get his love. You don't have to do something to, to, to become his favorite. You're already his favorite. You're already the beloved. Amen. But you got to know that I have a goal. I'm walking towards it. Amen? Amen. I'm going towards the fullness of the measure of the statue of Christ. Okay? So in this life, it's all about growing in knowledge so we can come to the perfect man. Now, all these things have already been accomplished and set. But why do Christians still struggle? Why don't they still reach the level God has for them? Number one, lack of knowledge. The Bible says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Like I said, you cannot access what you don't know you have. Okay, so they come. So I call Christianity uh, like this is like a big mansion with a door. And imagine the door is the cross. So they, they come to the cross, they come to the door and they're like, wow, thank you God for dying for me. And forever they stay at the at the door so many Christians they come stay at the door and they pitch camps at the door 
God, thank you for dying for me. That's all I ask, Lord. I don't want anything. Okay? And they don't, they don't want anything more. But like I said last week, Jesus didn't just come to, come to, die for you. He came to give you life, abundant life. So don't miss this Sunday. This month, Sunday, I'm going to be talking about how to access. Okay, I'm going to be talking about access. The access, God gave me a word for access, how to access the things of God. So many Christians, they come to God and they think salvation is all. Okay, so they come for salvation and forever they are asking for forgiveness of sins. Right? Every day. How many of you ask God forgiveness every day? Okay, don't, don't raise your hands. <laughs> you don't need to. You don't need to. You understand? You don't get saved every day. Salvation is once you are once you are saved. That's it. You are saved. You don't have to keep getting saved every day. Yeah. So you come to God. You are saved. You are safe. Grace has been provided for you. You are born again. You have received new life. You have become a new creation. You cannot lose that new life. Everybody say, I cannot lose. I cannot lose. This new life. This new life. Uh, so it is the Zoe life. It is a God life that you received. You are dead to yourself and alive to God through Christ Jesus. You have now received eternal life. Amen. So this eternal life has all the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And last week I showed you what are the, all the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Starting with salvation. Redemption. Yeah. Redemption. Forgiveness. Yeah, don't yeah, you're just yeah. What is the finished work of Jesus on the cross? You're, you're telling me the what he did to give you a uh, new life. You were justified, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I, 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 let me do. Let me. For those who are not last, here last week. All right. I'll just do it one time, okay? So number one, God. We start with creation. Creation, what happens after creation? Fall. So because of fall, God had to provide. Because of the fall, what happened? Because of the fall, sin came. Because of the sin came, law came. Yeah? Alright? So because of the law, Sin became a transgression. How did sin become a transgression? Because of the law. How many of you can explain this? Why did law make sin a transgression? If there is no law, there is no. Yeah. So, for example. In, when this COVID-19 thing happened, they said it is against the law for more than five people to yes. gather in a house. You could get arrested for that, right? So there was a... <coughs> so they said it's bad. But there was no law passed yet. So when there was no law passed, it was bad for more than five people to gather. But we still gathered. Because there was no law. They said it's bad. We are fit. We still gathered. It was sin. I mean, I'm just giving you an example. It was not sin, okay? Uh, that time they said they recommended. Okay, it's bad for more than five people together. We gathered ten people. It was sin. What is sin? Sin is a deviant. You're like, you're kind of like, are we going live after this? Okay. <laughs> yeah, you understand. And then suddenly... They had a press conference that week. I think I, I remember around March or something. And our dear prime minister came and said, "Now we pass the law that more, not more, no, you, that you cannot. There's only one or two people who can visit you, right? Mm. So everybody said they passed the law. Passed it was sin what we were doing. <laughs> but when they pass the law, you continue to do it. They will consider that action a transgression." You transgressed against the Australian law, the government. You understand? So similarly, sin was there. 
Okay? If the law was there, and if Adam and Eve sinned, God should have killed them right there. Right? He didn't. What did he do? Adam and Eve, what did he do? He, he killed an animal, took the skin of the animal and covered their nakedness, their sins, the separation. In fact, God was the one who provided the sacrifice, sacrifice for Adam and Eve, right from the garden. We never provided the sacrifice. It was him who provided the sacrifice. He never demanded the sacrifice. He was the one who provided the and he proved that with Abraham as well. Okay, so everybody say the law, the law. made sin, made sin. A, transgression. a transgression. So the transgression is what is punished. Punishment. The punishment was not for sin. So for example, you cannot be arrested for five people gathering until the law is so it's not the act of gathering that was punished it was the act of breaking the law that is so when the law came it brought along with it punishment it brought along with it death it brought wrath okay so Jesus came to fulfill this and to die for your so the redemption was from sin. What is sin? Separation. What are the two types of sin? Relational. Moral. What is relational sin? The act of separation. Not knowing the rebellion. Right? Or oh, we just didn't know the father. What is moral sin? All the immoral things that you do is more immor moral sin. Right? So, what did Jesus came mainly for? He came mainly for the? The relational, the separation. Okay? So, because of the separation, we went into rebellion and we started doing moral sins. Moral sin was not the big issue here. The relational separation from the father was the most important thing that Jesus came to fix. That's why Jesus, when he gave up his spirit on the cross, he said, My father, my father, why have you? Did the father forsake him? Why did Jesus say, My father, my father, why did you forsake me? He experienced the same human depravity from God. The same human cry that every human has. God, are you there? That separation. He became that. Amen? And of course, the moral sin as well. Okay. So then... Let's choose another color. So Jesus had to um, atone for our sins. Okay. So I will say atonement. Okay. What is atonement? Shedding of blood. Because according to the law, all things are purified by blood. According to the law, all things are purified by blood. So therefore, there was atonement that was needed. So until Jesus came, atonement was through the blood of goats and animals, the temporary sacrifice for several thousand years. Now Jesus comes into the picture as the final atonement with his own blood. I'm going to be teaching next topic that I'm going to be teaching is Hebrews, okay? So we'll be going through all this in detail. So don't worry. So we'll go everything one by one. So atonement. For atonement to be made possible, God had to have a physical flesh and body. Flesh and body. Blood. Without flesh and body, God cannot shed blood because God is a spirit. So therefore, in incarnation, what is incarnation? The word became flesh. So atonement. So yeah. So the the fall required God giving atonement. And incarnation okay so when he shed his blood through his blood we were um, justified yeah justified and sanctified all right Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7 
we were redeemed and forgiven everyone can see okay atonement was through the blood and atonement was made past possible through incarnation okay and when he atoned for our sins through by the shedding of blood he justified us and sanctified us he redeemed us and forgave us and now we are being everybody say glorified glorified this is what we must be focusing on this is already finished this is already done this is already done and this is already done what are you now great things glory amazing things that are waiting for us instead what are we focusing on oh jesus crying thank you god forgive me that that that's the initial part of your christianity not for 30 40 years or rest of your life when you have been for when you come to the knowledge of him thank you lord you cry and you say lord thank you thank you for saving me thank you for giving me this thank you for just me giving me a new lease on life now show me my bank account what have you what do you have for me lord <laughs> amen this is all the things that you have for me great let's co labor together lord let's 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 put the enemy to shame and let's do some great mighty things for you lord amen, amen. let my my life glorify you lord Let my life just bring glory and honor to you Lord. Let me go from glory to glory. Amen. Amen. Glorify. Amen. So you already been redeemed and you are forgiven. So that is why you don't need to ask for forgiveness every day. Because you are already forgiven. See, let, let's say you you fall into sin, you do something. It's okay. What do you do? You acknowledge that you are already been forgiven you don't need to feel bad that you're a terrible person you're not you're not a horrible person you're not a sinner the enemy will catch you in the act or whatever and he'll make you feel guilt and that is not from god okay guilt is not from god everybody say i'm i'm already redeemed i'm already I'm already forgiven. I'm already forgiven. Forgiveness is not a transaction. It is a gift that was given. Amen. Forgiveness for everybody say this one more time. Forgiveness, forgiveness. is not asked for. It's not asked. It's received. You get it? In our human understanding of forgiveness, this is how forgiveness works in our mind. Um Anish offended me. Okay, let's say, example. Like, he doesn't. It's too sweet. Let's say Anish offended me. Okay, and I didn't forgive him because I'm human, right? I'm a very bad human. Example. So he comes to me and say, "Please, will you forgive me?" And I say, "Okay, if you don't do those things again, I will forgive you. I will just give me two months, right?" And that's how we understand forgiveness. We understand forgiveness as a transaction. He comes and says sorry and I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. I'll I'll forgive you. But that's not how forgiveness works with God. With God, he doesn't wait for you to ask for forgiveness to forgive you. He has already forgiven you. He waits for you to believe that he's already forgiven you. You get it? Everybody say, God waits for me to believe that he has already forgiven me. See, that's how forgiveness works with God. So you don't necessarily have to go to God and say God forgive me forgive me. He said thank you that you've already forgiven me. I I might have fallen short now but God thank you that you've already forgiven me. I'm going to go on and I'm not going to do the same mistakes again. That is repentance. Repentance is not feeling sorry for yourself and bad for yourself. That is a guilt trip. And humanly it'll make you feel good for a while because you cried enough. It'll make you feel good for a while because you 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 punished yourself. See, a lot of times humans punish themselves for their mistakes. You you get it? That's why people 
cut themselves, beat themselves up, and blame themselves for things that they think they're responsible for. And that comes from a place of guilt, and that comes from the enemy. What God does, He tells you, my son, my daughter, what you did, sure. But I'm not going to count that against you. In fact, in the eyes of God, when you go and tell him that you did something, he'll be like, what thing? Yeah? So you are being glorified. So what is the goal that I told you? Perfect? Man. Man? The fullness of? Christ. Christ. This is our goal. Amen. Not just get by in life, not just trip and fall and oh, I made heaven. You know, somehow I just tripped and fell into the pearly gates, you know. They were about to close and I just made it, Lord. Yay! No, that's not it. You, you, it heaven is a show. You, look, eternal life is yours. It is not about going to heaven. It is about the fullness of Christ on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? That's, that's the goal. You are already, you already made it in life. You are already, you, you, now it's up to you to believe in the finished work of Jesus on the cross and start hitting goals. Amen? Financial goals. Health goals. Amen? Your career goals. Your marriage goals. Oh, I'm not, I'm not hearing amen. A lot of things to be, no amen. I said marriage goals. Amen. The best of the best of the best for you. Amen. Handsome, beautiful, rich, that's it, nothing less. Amen? Amen. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Somebody else is just saying amen to the hill. You, know, you need to say it, okay? You need to believe. Okay? Take it. I'm releasing. See, I'm, I'm don't just say I'm, I'm think I'm just saying some things. I'm prophetically releasing. So I'm gonna give you one more chance. I said <laughs> handsome, rich, God-fearing man in Jesus' name. Amen. Beautiful. <laughs> no, you say amen for his sisters. <laughs> Beautiful, rich, visionary, anointed woman of God in Jesus' name. Amen. That's it. Nothing short of amazing. All right. Everybody say nothing short of amazing. God has the best, so you gotta believe it. Don't no second best for you guys. In my, in in life for children, I don't believe in second best. I want the best. Amen. Amen. Best. God, you give me the best, Lord. You give me the best. Amen. You gotta go for the best. In every area, go for the best. But identify seasons in your life. Lord, if I'm going through this, that is what you have for me, but I'm going. So don't settle. Like I said, don't settle for your wilderness. Thinking it's your promised land. God has a promised land waiting for you. But life is a journey. And as you go through it, God will take you to that perfect man to be completely glorified to the fullness of Christ the measure that God has for you. Amen? Amen? And when you have Christ as your goal, as your everything, your number one priority is Christ. And you're growing, growing, growing in that. Every other thing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Amen? You go, you do something, you start a business, it will be the best. You start a church, it will be the best. Amen. You start, you, 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 you go for some, it will be the best. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the entrance of your word. Your word brings light. Today, Lord, thank you for everyone here tonight. Let the word of God completely transform. Take your people to the next level. Lord, we are not settling for less. We are not settling for just the... The, the, the crumbs, oh Lord. We want the loaf, the hot loaf of bread on the table. We are not settling, Lord. We, we are going for the best, oh Lord. We are going for the best of the best. We are going for the, 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 the lion's share of blessing, oh Father God, in our lives. 
Lord, I know it's not just about blessing. I know, Lord, Father God, but Lord, you are our greatest blessing. But Lord, in every area, the finished work of Jesus has provided us healing. The finished work of Jesus has provided us complete salvation. The finished work of Jesus has provided us prosperity, sound mind. Completion in every area. So Lord, I speak completion in every area of life, Father God. Whatever your children may have lacked in the past, Lord, you're going to cover all of that. And you're going to make, the, 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 it, God, heaven is going to make it up to them in the things that are about to be revealed in their life, oh, Father God. I release it upon their lives in the name of Jesus. Whatever the enemy tried to steal several years ago, Maybe, Lord, uh, uh, relationships were stolen. Maybe, Lord, uh, the finances were stolen. But, Lord, I prophesy it will be returned back to them a hundredfold of Father God. Amen. They will see what the previous generation did not see, Lord, Father God. I prophesy into their life. Whatever the previous generation lost uh, in this generation of Father God, you're going to triple or oh, increase them in the name of Jesus. Oh, maybe there was death in the previous generation. I cancel it right now in the name of Jesus. And I speak increase and life in the next generation of Father God. And it starts with your children. It starts with these people sitting here right now in the name of Jesus. Because you have promised us increase. You have promised us full completion of Father God. Amen. We have a goal. And that goal is not mediocre. That goal is not something small. That goal is not something halfway, half big. Lord, we are going all the way. All the way, Lord. We receive it. And Lord, help us to persevere. Help us to fight this good, of, good fight of faith. Until we all come to the unity of faith. To the fullness of the glory, to the full measure of completeness of Father God, in the stature of the fullness, full measure of Christ. And thank you, Jesus, for giving us this goal in our life, in our spiritual life. We give you the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. God bless you. Any questions? Yeah.